All right, eight o'clock. Good morning, everyone. Uh, extremely uh, pleasure to be here. My name is Ivan, and this morning I'm gonna uh, share with you my experience, my knowledge, and uh, let's say the, the interesting things I found around implementing a layhouse in Azure. Uh, so my name is Ivan, as I mentioned, I'm based in Bulgaria. I'm really sorry that I can't be in place in London uh, this week. But anyway, at least I'm grateful that I can share with you virtually uh, my knowledge. I'm an MVP on Data Platform, and I work as a Data Platform Architect at the World Bank Group. And without any further ado, let's just begin. in. Now, the agenda for today is uh, kind of, I want to quickly uh, wrap up what Lakehouse pattern is, uh, what it means, what are its core capabilities, and then I'm going to show and cover some challenges and patterns that throughout my journey on implementing playhouses in Azure, I found to be quite, well, not very clear when you start designing a solution uh, with, with the lakehouse. The questions, uh, I prefer we cover them in the end. So if you have any question, just questions, you can either ask them in the chat and I'll look at those after the, the session or uh, you can keep them for the last five, six minutes of today's uh, presentation. So what is a layhouse? The best way to implement, to, uh, to kind of explain uh, a layhouse uh, is to kind of compare it to the data warehouse. What was the data warehouse? It was a single engine, relational based, which was responsible both for storing your data in a structured manner and then modeling and serving it as a SQL engine. So SQL kind of queries, you can have referential integrity or ACID properties and so on and so forth. Data warehouses have been around for like 30, 40 years or, or something like that. And they were really good for business intelligence for uh, descriptive and uh, kind of historic uh, scenarios. Data engineering was, very well covered within a data warehouse. You can use a plethora of tools to, to do this. But then those real time and data science scenarios that you see here weren't really uh, native to the data warehouse. It's, well, it, it was difficult, it is difficult to implement them because of the nature of the data, uh, you need to do exploration, you need to bring new data very quickly and uh, you also need a massive scale on compute and store. So data warehouses weren't very good on that. Even if you go that road, it's gonna be really, really, really expensive. So what about real time? Again, it's in data warehousing, that's fairly difficult to implement. Uh, you require quite a lot of additional technologies. Not that it's impossible, it's possible, but very expensive and very difficult to maintain. So. Lakehouse was introduced like, I don't know, uh, a year or two ago as a pattern, practical pattern. And it aims at covering exactly all those four scenarios, business intelligence, real time data science and data engineering that you have here on top of, uh, of the deck. And making sure that you can use a single engine and a single platform to implement all those things. How is this really achieved? In the layhouse, you have two separate distinct, like distinct layers. The data lake, which sits here at the bottom, which is your store part, where you store your structured, semi-structured or unstructured data. And this is practically a data lake we all know and we, that's been around for like 10 years now. And then you have the lakehouse engine. So that's the compute part. And that compute part would allow you to run SQL, R, or Python, or Scala, or whatever language uh, you are confident or comfortable with, and explore that data lake data. So uh, you probably say, okay, but we have Databricks, we have Synapse, we, can, we could have been reading with Spark uh, this data lake data for, well, since the data lake uh, started. Yes, but there was very there, there was one very critical piece of uh, tech or functionality or capability that was missing, and that was updating 
existing data in the data lake natively. Second, you are missing the ACID transactions. So transaction support was kind of scarce. And the SQL piece was not very well covered. So if you wanted to do data exploration on top of the lake, you could still do it with Spark, but you had to know kind of I, I, either PySpark or Spark SQL and work with notebooks. There wasn't really a native client that can uh, that can work uh, with just as you would, for instance, work with uh, Management Studio or something like that. So what are the core capabilities a Lakehouse engine have to support? So first, I mentioned transaction support, meaning all the ACID properties, atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability, and so on. It has to cover SQL queuing. That's the idea. So the Lakehouse engine has a native SQL language support. It allows you to have streaming support, incremental loading, meaning merge, upserts, and deletes, and so on, and then common meta store. Now, why the common meta store? So if you if you think of it uh, and compare it with the data warehouse, with the data warehouse, the moment you log into the engine, being that SQL Server, Teradata, Oracle, whatever, you 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 see the databases and you have permissions. Uh, you just use them. You write queries, whatever you need. Now with Databricks, let's say, or Synapse, or any other Spark tool, this meta store was mostly isolated, isolated or just part of the particular cluster. Cluster. So if you are implementing a lakehouse pattern, one very critical capability to think of is how to implement your common meta store so that if you have even 10, 20, 30 different uh, workspaces or Synapse Analytics workspaces or Databricks workspaces, they can all connect to the common metadata. Otherwise, you will have to replicate your tables and structures uh, in each workspace. And finally, you need also BI tool support, meaning you will need uh, capability for that Lakehouse engine or that compute that would allow traditional BI tools like Power BI, Tableau, uh, what and whatnot to connect natively rather than you going through uh, through different hoops to get this data out from the Lakehouse. So what are the services that support this in Azure? So the store data, obviously, that's uh, Azure Storage Account Gen 2 with uh, hierarchical namespace enabled, that's critical. There are a lot of things to consider in that area, so I will dig into that in a bit. And then on the compute part, you have two distinct options. That's Databricks and Synapse Analytics. I have to say that, so first of all, this session will not be a comparison between Databricks and Synapse. So it will be more of a, what can you do in both platforms? And what would work so, so that you can understand uh, which pattern and which way you want to go? Because Databricks and Synapse workspaces have their own benefits, but there and uh, also some challenges. So, going to the data lake because it's decoupled from the compute. Uh, in in the lake house, you really need to take care of your uh, data lake layer. And when you're implementing a lakehouse in, in Azure, starting with a good data lake is crucial because uh, after that, it's, it, it might be challenging to implement it. So the best practice is always keep at, at least three different zones for your data lake data. Uh, so being that landing row or bronze for your uh, original data, enriched for your cleanse data and uh, curated or gold layer for your kind of uh, data product, and then you also have the analytics workspaces, or not the analytics workspaces, but the analytics uh, data storages. Those are kind of specific, I would say, for uh, the Synapse Analytics pattern, and I'll explain in a bit. So let's just quickly cover uh, those uh, four, uh, those three main uh, zones. What's their purpose? And what are the best practices to arrange them at least at least a, a sample implementation, let's say. Because in your organization, you might really need to go in a slightly different organizational pattern, uh, organizing uh, pattern. 
So the, real, the, the, the row or landing zone is your immutable data. Here, you land your data and you never change it. You only read it. It has restricted access for only data engineering team, and it's used, it's used only for integration scenarios. The purpose here is land your data as quickly as possible and in as raw format as possible, and do not change it ever. You still have to implement a lifecycle policy. The lifecycle policy is needed because this layer will grow it, and it will grow a lot. So if you don't have a policy to purge or archive your data, you're going to increase your cost. This is the zone that requires this policy the most. Uh, I wouldn't say that the enriched and gold really uh, have uh, that much, I don't know, you have to consider that much when implementing such a policy. But the row zone, it's absolutely critical. On the left-hand side, you can see a sample uh, kind of a folder structure, which you can use to get your data in and structure that data uh, when you land it in, in, in your row zone. The silver zone, so or, or the enriched zone, that is where you do your schema and da data cleansing. So you land the data here after you've done schema uh, checks, schema evolution, data cleansing activities, you've done your data validation and standardization, you, you've written it in parquet format, and it's mostly business driven. So it's now driven rather than the source. So let's say uh, finance system, uh, accounting system, marketing system, and so on and so forth, which is the raw zone. Now you have these data sets in the enriched or silver zone, more business oriented, that would show kind of, uh, is that a transactional data? Is that master data? Is that sensitive data? And to what data product they might relate to? And finally, your curated zone, completely business-driven structure. It has to have, uh, this is your gold kind of uh, data product. So this is what your users will consume. It has to be semantically correct. It has to have proper namings. It has, it has to be highly governed. So it has to be part of a catalog. Uh, you have to look for data quality. You have to do a lot of data QAing in this area and so on and so forth. And one very important thing is that I've seen in, uh, in my experience, a lot of practices or a lot of use cases where the surf part would really require uh, fast modeling. So uh, what do I mean by fast modeling? Sub-second performance on joining and, and creating facts and exposing facts and dimensions. So if you are in that pattern, then on, in, in your gold lake, you still keep your parquet files and your data, but the same data is also exposed through a relational engine. Either SQL database or dedicated pools or any other relational engine. The relational engine will bring you, will give you the subsequent performance and the referential integrity that you might need in certain use cases. So it's not like you have to choose a gold layer and keep it only in the lake and uh, never use SQL data warehouse. It's actually both in, in some cases. So keep that in mind. So these are the three layers. They're common whichever way you choose to, uh, to go with uh, either Databricks or Synapse Analytics. But if you go with Synapse Analytics, you have to consider something else. Whenever you provision a Synapse Analytics workspace, you have to provide a primary storage account or a primary container, which will host any data lake data or any lake data for that particular workspace. And if you decide to go with, a, with let's say you need to have 10 or 20 or 30 different workspaces, you might end up with 10, 20, 30 different storage account, which might turn out to be difficult to manage. Also, if you end up with different storage accounts, you might really be challenged into providing access and uh, attaching all those additional storage accounts or common data lakes that you might have. 
on each of the workspaces. That's why the best practice for implementing the Synapse Analytics workspaces, and there is an article by, by Jovan Popovic, uh, by the way, I will have it in, uh, in the deck as a reference. Uh, it explains really in detail. But the best practice is the following. If you have one geolocation, so all your analytics, engineering teams, and so on and so forth are in one uh, geolocation, let's say in, in, in the States or in, in Europe. And in that case, you build one data lake, one storage account. And in that storage account, you create for the different workspaces analytics containers, which you use for your Synapse. Now, when that pattern changes, that pattern changes if your analytics teams are in long, one geolocation, but your enterprise data lake is in another geolocation. Geo in that case, you don't have a choice. You, you'd better separate your uh, analytics workspace storage accounts with your enterprise data lake in different locations so that the analytics workspaces and storage accounts are closer together. Why is that important? Because this incur incurs costs. If your storage accounts and, uh, and data engineering live in different geolocations, then all this egress and ingress traffic will increase the cost. So let me show you how the Synapse workspace looks like with, with let's say, uh, a scenario with a single location, single geolocation. So I have two teams. One is finance and one is engineering, let's say, and they all uh, have their uh, Synapse workspaces. And I have also a common enterprise data lake, which contains my entire enterprise data. If you look at the structure here, I have, I have one storage account, but I have three different containers. So those three different containers are based on uh, a centralized data lake and then a container for each of the workspaces. So how this exactly is being represented in Synapse? So if I go to a Synapse, and I go to uh, my data uh, tab. By default, if you go to your workspaces, you can see the lake databases, which I'll cover in a bit. But if you go to your linked data, whenever you provision a Synapse workspace, you have to provide one primary storage account. Let me see if I can expand this. So, come on. See, that's primary, but that's the Synapse Engineering workspace. If you look at the Storage Explorer, that's this piece. If I expand it, the fact that I attached the container, I was able to also see everything else in the storage account where this container was. So if you structure, like this, your storage account, you would easily be able to browse as, as, as long as you have permissions, of course, you would easily be able to access everything else as a container here, rather than bringing and attaching and trying to manage credentials for external containers and external data lakes to this particular storage account. So this is one very valuable uh, pattern that you can employ if you are using multiple workspaces. Because from this point forward, I can easily go to my enterprise data lake. So, uh, and I can very easily access my data. Let's say my curated data, that's the taxi reporting. Let's run top 100. and practical SQL experience with my serverless pool. So uh, it, it will take 10 or 20 seconds. So let's, uh, I'll just move, uh, move on to, uh, ah, okay. So it was quicker, sorry. So there's the data. See, I, would, I was really easily able to uh, connect to the enterprise data lake. 
moving along. Uh, yep. So uh, the next thing I'd like to discuss is how or, or what are the specifics for each of the engines that uh, you can you can use to implement a lake house. Uh, okay, so before that, uh, one critical thing, if you are not aware of, for, for, with the lake format or the delta lake format, the piece that actually brings all those capabilities, transaction support, incremental loading, SQL curing, uh, the, the tech that brings it in is delta format. So uh, delta is an, uh, kind of an open source format that sits on top of Parquet and that Databricks or generally any Spark engine now uh, incorporates. And that delta format allows you to have uh, merge statements, uh, inserts and deletes in your uh, data lake, data Parquet files. Uh, you have transaction support and so on and so forth. So, Databricks. When we talk implementation of a lake house, there are at least two different kind of personas that would use the lake house. One is the data engineers who are usually doing high code, Python kind, uh, hardcore uh, command and transformations. And the second persona type is mostly around data exploration. Business users, power users, integration services like uh, Power BI or uh, machine learning and things like that. So for those, you have two separate pieces of technology that you use within Databricks and within Synapse. Within Databricks, if you are a data engineer, uh, you would use the data science and kind of machine learning standard clusters that you've been using for, for a decade now. Those are still there, but this is high code environment. If you need to browse your data, do data exploration, connect to Power BI, the easiest way is evaluating and using the SQL, uh, the Databricks SQL or SQL analytics in Databricks. This is a new type of cluster, new type of service that is offered as part of Databricks Premium, which gives you a SQL native kind of experience to build dashboards, queries, explore your data, and share that data with others. If you need to integrate, most of the integration scenarios for best performance and usability are with the SQL, uh, with uh, the SQL analytics or Databricks SQL. Let me show you what Databricks SQL is. So, if I am in in my Databricks workspace and I am in premium, uh, in the premium Databricks tier, I would be able to see this kind of SQL here which is an entirely new offering. And within that, you can, let's say, let me show you a dashboard. You can create dashboards like this, which you can parameterize, you can refresh, you can schedule, and it is working against a compute engine, which is called a SQL endpoint. The SQL endpoint is practically, again, a, a, a compute, a Databricks compute, which uses a new, engine, new tech stack that is much faster in this area. The SQL endpoint works primarily with SQL. So it only works with SQL. So you can't really write uh, Python or anything else. But it's really great for your database users for all your power users that are used to write SQL. Here's how a SQL query look like in this, let's say this one. Absolutely traditional ANSI SQL compatible with subqueries, with parameters, see those double curly brackets, and so on and so forth. And all those you can run as part of Databricks SQL. The uh, endpoints 
come in different sizes and with different uh, high availability clusters. So it's Databricks did a really good job on enabling SQL analytics uh, behavior on top of uh, on top of a data lake. So if you're going into the Databricks space, SQL endpoints is a must, as well as your standard data science and engineering approach and notebooks and, and so on and so forth. What are the specifics, some key points when implementing Azure Databricks? One key thing is that Azure Databricks is generally cloud agnostic and it, it can integrate with Azure Active Directory, for instance, but you need to do something additional. Uh, so for uh, Databricks, you need to have this uh, SEIM provisioning connector, which allows you to automatically synchronize AD groups or users from your Active Directory to Databricks. So no more manual provisioning of users, adding to groups and so on and so forth. A best practice, if you are enabling SQL endpoints, is to implement a service principle with table ACLs pattern. I don't really have time to discuss this pattern, but please look it up if you're going to, to, to go for SQL endpoints. Uh, permissions in Databricks, something that we found out is that permissions are mostly either elevated or kind of user slash read only behavior. You don't have this concept of an application administrator where you can still have the administrators who can provision the workspace, manage the workspace and so on and so forth. But then you don't really have this kind of a middle role that would allow uh, database management, creating catalogs, assigning additional permissions. And this was kind of difficult, especially in our organization. This was really difficult in, in terms of adoption Databricks. So you always have to go to the administrator to, to do any kind of slightly elevated uh, permissions need, like creating a catalog or assigning tackles. In terms of engineering with Databricks, you have to use the, for data engineering, the engineering standard of hyperscale clusters for high code patterns. And there are third party tools that you can utilize for uh, if you want to go into the metadata driven uh, pattern. So tools like DBT, which is a third party or Delta Life Tables, which is in preview, I strongly recommend you review before you decide how to do your data engineering if you go with the Databricks approach. The DevOps is either on notebook or workspace level. So you have the granularity and whichever way you decide to go, you can do it in Databricks. And there are slight considerations when you need to bring data from on-prem. If you are in a hybrid cloud or not hybrid cloud, but a hybrid environment with data on-premise, and then uh, your uh, engineering is in cloud, well, with Databricks, it might be slightly difficult, especially if you have restricted networks and a lot of compliance to meet before you kind of can connect your Databricks workspace uh, to your on-prem data. For data analysis, if you're going with the Databricks, uh, then you SQL endpoints, you, uh, you would like to evaluate SQL, uh, serverless SQL endpoints, which is something that comes in uh, as a public preview just a couple of weeks ago. And if you want to connect Power BI, you use the Power BI certified uh, through Partner Connect connector, which is GA, and you can easily use it with Power BI, even today. So that connector, Azure Databricks, you can connect to your uh, SQL endpoint. What about Synapse? So with Synapse, uh, I suppose you're already familiar with Synapse. So I'm, uh, I'm not gonna go into too much details on Synapse Analytics. And if you'd like to know more, there, there are quite a lot of sessions in, uh, in today's, uh, in yesterday and today on Synapse. So feel free to, uh, to look at those uh, if you need more details for what Synapse Analytics is. But so moving to uh, 
implementation and those different personas that I mentioned. So if you are a data engineer, you would still use data factory for, uh, or Synapse pipelines for that matter, to bring your data in. So that's your ingestion mechanism. If you are into the high code or uh, machine learning data science uh, kind of persona, you use Synapse Spark tools. And if you are into the data exploration use case, uh, connectivity to external BI tools and so on and so forth, then you use Synapse SQL serverless. There is another option. So instead of using Synapse SQL serverless, you can use a dedicated pool. The thing with a dedicated pool is it provides you uh, predictable performance, predictable availability, and so on and so forth, but it costs a lot. So it will cost you because you will have to run it on a kind of a dedicated capacity. And the critical part with, uh, with the dedicated pool and Synapse Spark and Serverless is that Synapse and uh, the Spark and Serverless share the same metadata store and the dedicated pool has its own kind of meta store through Polybase. So if you're looking into sharing a common meta store across all those three kind of capabilities or uh, computes, then uh, you are in a tough spot. Some additional details on authentication and authorization and native support data uh, Synapse Analytics has native support and integration with Azure Active Directory. And it is really well on defining different roles within your Synapse workspace. So you have RBAC, which are on resource level like administrator and owner and contributor and so on and so forth. But you also have inside your Synapse workspace, additional roles like uh, uh, you can allow certain people to use certain clusters or certain people to create uh, connections or use certain credentials and uh, others do not. And you can implement Azure Active Directories and so uh, the Azure Active Directory groups and so on and so forth. In terms of engineering, for low code, you can use Synapse pipelines. You do not have this capability in Databricks. For high code environment, you need you can use Spark pools, but keep in mind that if you're looking for one-to-one -one mapping of, of code, or if you if you're going to compare Databricks, uh, Databricks runtime and Spark and uh, Synapse Analytics Spark's runtime, there are differences. So Databricks are slightly ahead, and they kind of support additional things which are still not available in Spark, although Microsoft is progressing really fast. And uh, the DevOps piece, so the DevOps is only on workspace level. Unfortunately, you can't uh, kind of do cherry pick uh, DevOps for cert only certain objects. If you are into data analysis, you use servers, a serverless SQL for data exploration or dedicated pools if you need this additional data virtualization, predictable performance kind of experience. Native Power BI connector is still in preview. So if you want to connect Power BI to, uh, to serverless SQL, that's still in preview. You can use the one that allows you to connect to dedicated pools but this would mean that if you're using Power BI with dedicated pools, you have to have dedicated pools, which is much more expensive than serverless. Now, let me show you uh, if you have, let's say you have now a data lake and you want to transfer it to a lake house pattern. You already have your parquet data. How do you move to, uh, a, parquet, uh, to a delta format? It's fairly easy, to be honest. So you always have the option of reading the original data and writing it in Delta format using Spark. So this is, uh, this is one path of migration, which would mean you would have to duplicate and read your entire uh, data again. Another path is doing an in place. So let me close a couple of things. So I have a Spark pool, 
oh i had obviously it uh, it expired so anyway i'm not gonna run anything i'll just show you a couple of things that i ran this morning earlier this morning so this is a databricks notebook i have defined a catalog which is called uh, taxi lake house and i have a table taxi data and my original table was just uh data lake parquet format without any delta you know, implemented on top and i want to convert this table into a lake format how can i do that in place so option number one you can use convert to delta syntax which is sql based keep in mind that synapse still does not recognize that pattern so you might not uh, see it as a valid syntax when uh, when you code it but if you run this it will it will just work you can also use the uh, convert to delta method in uh, PySpark. so you can do all those things in place now the important around uh, so what really delta gives you so i mentioned sql uh, acid supportability transactions merges and so on and so forth but what exactly this this means so first i can do time travel meaning i can look at the data and how it's changed if i if i run describe history over my table i can see the different versions that i have for this data I can also see what were the changes implemented in this particular version. So in this case, I said, okay, you know what? I want you to uh, do an update for everything that is well later than 2022. And this version, I can then potentially decide to use to recover my data. One trick moment here is that with SQL, you still, in, in Azure Synapse, you still cannot do time travel using SQL syntax. Version as of, which is supported theoretically, still gives you an error like, like this. So if you try to run it, it will error out. So if you need to access a version, a previous version, you can do that in PySpark easily. Like, can you please load version as of zero? This is my original data. Load it up in, in a data frame and use that data frame later on. Couple of things, important things around merging and uh, recovering data. If you're going to use data frames, it's fairly easy. So you get your historical or original data uh, in, in a data frame, you load in the data frame your current state, and then you run, uh, you run a merge command. It will handle things for you automatically. But if you are in, in, in SQL, those two, you, you can't use data frames there. You have to materialize. So what I found out is that I had to materialize the tables before I can do the merge piece, which is, well, slightly uncomfortable. Probably this will change. Probably I did something wrong, but I couldn't find a way to do this uh, without materializing the tables. So if you want to do merge with your historical versions, you have to go with PySpark for now. If you want to do traditional merge with already materialized table, uh, things like a slow changing dimension type two, uh, then you can use the merge command. It's supported. Look at the documentation, fairly straightforward, the same as you would do it SQL, for instance, SQL Server or uh, Oracle. So uh, next thing, how about Actually, let me step back. If you are into the lake house pattern and you're going into the lake house pattern, you do now have the capability to merge up, sort your data uh, transactions and uh, time travel and so on and so forth. But how do you do incremental loading? What's the fastest way? 
you can still do your merges and uh, reading your delta table, something like CDC on the, on, on, on the source, and process this manually. But in Databricks, there's something which is, uh, I mentioned delta life tables, but there's also another thing called auto loader. Both of those in combination would really help you streamline your incremental data loading. This is exclusive to Databricks. It's still not available. The auto loader was not available until at least until two weeks ago. Uh, the auto loader experience is still not available in Synapse. So if you want to streamline your incremental loading, you have to build a custom solution. That is usually a trigger on top of your blob storage that will uh, trigger some pipelines or perform some uh, some Spark notebooks or things like that. So the incremental loading is per service, depending on which service you choose, you will have to figure out the pattern. Metadata sharing. What if I have 20 workspaces and I want them all to use the same metadata? Well, actually I have a couple of slides for this, so I'll, uh, I'll use them in a bit. Uh, I already mentioned, so let's cover the speeding up, the transformation and loading part here. Oops, sorry. Uh, so with Databricks, you do have to evaluate uh, DBT. Please do. That will provide you uh, with some ideas and it will, ex it will really ease your transformation piece when you're implementing uh, a lake house pattern. In Synapse, if you want to go to a metadata driven or pattern like or factory kind of model, then you can use flowlets still in preview. Or for instance, you can use custom metadata driven framework, the one that Paul Andrew, for instance, uh, has been blogging about for the last couple of years. So feel free to explore uh, both of those solutions in Databricks and Synapse and see what would work the most for you. In my experience, because of, uh, let's say, this piece, we decided to go with kind of a Databricks approach rather than Synapse, uh, together with the autoloader and, uh, well, a couple of more things, but the uh, DBT piece was kind of crucial for making a decision. So as I promised, the metadata piece, metadata sharing. Serverless and Spark pools share the same metadata. Whatever you define as catalogs, tables, uh, that taxi lakehouse database that I showed you, they are both visible by the serverless pool and the Spark pool. And there's this preview concept right now, which is called lakehouse database by Microsoft, which sits in Synapse. Then these are all shared. So the, that database, that Lakehouse database is also shared as metadata between those two services. The dedicated pool uses its own. So if you want all those three compute services to have the same metadata, you will have to do that manually. So you register uh, here or here, whatever new table or catalog you want, but then you have to replicate that configuration automatically or manually to your dedicated pool. There's no other way just yet. What if you have multiple workspaces? Your only way is to use your enterprise lake for the entire common set of data and allow the different workspaces to use that data by registering it respectively. It's still a manual effort. See, so if I create a database in, in these two pools, serverless and the Spark pool, within that workspace, and I want to share it with others, so like this workspace connect to the, this database, well, that's not gonna work, unfortunately. The way it would work is if you create this database here, but also create that same database with same paths and same everything in here. 
And here comes the challenge of manually replicating every single change. Because in here, you might want to do uh, table ACLs that you miss configuring here. So there are certain challenges around metadata sharing. Again, Databricks is slightly ahead uh, in, in that game because they have a public, uh, no, I, no, I don't think it's public, I think it's private preview now, something called Unity Catalog, which would allow you to build a catalog inside your workspace, but share that catalog across different workspaces and consuming services. So this, in that case, might become your uh, kind of uh, common store, the Unity catalog. So we have five more minutes. Uh, the only thing that I haven't covered is high availability and disaster recovery. So just give me one minute and then we'll move to questions. So there is no native high availability or disaster recovery mechanisms in any of the services. So you will have to think about those on your own. You will have to evaluate the type of workloads you're having and for each specific workload plan and design a solution. The key services or things to consider, DevOps and GitHub for your code repositories. You still have asset transactions on top of your lake house. So if something fails or clusters are unavailable or something goes down, you will theoretically, you will have uh, your transactions reverted and rolled back. But as part of an ETL, if the ETL fails, you will still have to kind of recover uh, the data or have to implement your own recovery method. There is nothing available as of yet to say, please restore my data lake or lake house database as of this point. Every single piece of backup versioning or uh, soft delete that you can implement on top of your data lake is per file. So it still doesn't work like restoring a database as of time. So keep that in mind. And then on the storage, you still, I, I mentioned that you can use versioning, soft deletes uh, to kind of prevent uh, data losses and reverts of to, to old versions. And keep in mind that in storage backup is manual. If you are into zone redundant storage or uh, read availability uh, zone redundant storage, the DR or well, the switch uh, to the DR uh, region is not automatic. You might need to go through Microsoft. It might take between 24 to 48 hours. So all those things you need to consider. There is no native solution to that. So I'll skip the summary and uh, for the rest of the two, three minutes, let's just uh, cover any questions and uh, please submit your feedback. I would really like uh, to understand if you like the session, what can I uh, change? What can I uh, provide additional as an information? How do you like the event? Generally, you know, the feedback is important. So questions. Thanks for that, Ivan. That was, um, sorry, am I, am I on? Uh, that was really good. Um, thank you very much. Have you got, have you got any questions in the room? No? Any, any, f <laughs> okay. No questions from the room, Ivan. Thank you very much for giving up your time on a Saturday morning. Okay. Everybody, thank you. Thank have you a great too. rest of your sequel bits. It's Saturday. Enjoy it. Awesome. Enjoy it, everyone. Bye.